So first, on behalf of the Norwegian and Danish Math Society, we would like to congratulate you on winning the Abel Prize uh, for 2005. Thank you very much. Um, you came to the U.S. in 1941 as a 15-year-old kid from Hungary. Yes. And only three years later, in 1944, you were drafted into the U.S. Army. Instead of being shipped overseas to the war front, you were sent to Los Alamos in 1945 to participate in the Manhattan Project, building the first atomic bomb. It must have been awesome as a young man to come to Los Alamos taking part, admittedly a small part, in such a momentous endeavor and to meet so many legendary famous scientists, Fermi, Bethe, Zilar, Wigner, Teller, Feynman, to name some of the physicists, and von Neumann and Ulam, to name some of the mathematicians. I want to ask you, how did this experience shape your view of mathematics and influence your choice of research field within mathematics? Um, it uh, certainly, uh, that first, uh, time I spent in Los Alamos, and then I returned there after I got my PhD in 49. I went back for a year and then spent many summers as a consultant. And that, especially the later exposure, shaped my uh, mathematical thinking. First of all, it was the experience of being part of a scientific team not just of mathematicians whose uh, uh, people with different outlooks and the aim being not a theorem but a product. Uh, one cannot learn that from books. One must be a participant. And for that reason, I urged my students to spend at least a summer as a visitor at Los Alamos. Los Alamos had a very active visitors program. Um, secondly, it was there, and that was in the 50s, that I became imbued with the utter importance of computing for science and mathematics. Because Los Alamos, under the influence of von Neumann, was for a while, the 50s, early 60s, the uh, undisputed leader in computational science. I, I want to come back to the computers later, but uh, I want first to ask you uh, about your, uh, main, some of your main uh, research contributions in mathematics. You have made outstanding contributions to the theory of nonlinear partial differential equations and in particular for the theory of and numerical solutions of hyperbolic systems of conservation laws, your uh, contribution has been very decisive. Not to mention your contribution to the understanding of the propagation of discontinuities, so-called shocks. Could you describe, and this is very difficult, in a few words, how you and your, your collaborators were able to overcome the formidable obstacles and difficulties this area of mathematics presented? Uh, well, uh, when I started to work on it, I was uh, very much influenced by two papers. One was Eberhard Hopf on the viscous limit of Berger's equation, and the other was von Neumann and Richtmeier's paper on artificial viscosity. And... Uh, I, looking at these examples, I was able to see what the general theory might look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what about um, uh, this astonishing discovery of Kruskal and Zabuski in the 1960s of the role of solu uh, solitons for solutions of the Quartevig, de Vries, or KDV equation? and the no less astonishing sub subsequent explanation given by several people that the KDV equation is completely integrable. Uh, represented, that must have represented a revolutionary development within the theory of nonlinear partial differential equations. And you extend, uh, enter this field with an ingenious original point of view, introducing the so-called Lax pair 
which gave an understanding of how the inverse scattering transfer uh, applies to equations like the KDV, uh, and also to other nonlinear equations which are central in mathematical physics, like the sine Gordon and the nonlinear Schrödinger equation. C could you uh, try, uh, give us uh, some thoughts about how important you think this uh, uh, theory is for mathematical physics and for applications, and how do you view the future of this field? Uh, yes, perhaps I'll s start by pointing out that the astonishing phenomenon of, of the interaction of solitons was discovered by numerical calculations, uh, as was predicted by von Neumann some years before, that calculations will reveal extremely interesting phenomena. And since I was a good friend of uh, Krasko's, I, and I learned early about uh, his discoveries and started me thinking. And I was uh, trying to think. It, w it was c quite clear that there are infinitely many conserved quantities. And so my thinking was, how can you generate all at once an infinitude of conserved quantities? And uh, I thought, if you had a transformation that preserves the spectrum of an operator, then that would be such a transformation. So, and that turned out to be a very fruitful idea, ap applicable quite uh, widely. Now, you say, how important is it? I think it's pretty, pretty important. Um, after all, uh, from the point of view of technology uh, for the transmission of signals, signaling by, by uh, solitons is a, a very important and, and promising future technology in transoceanic transmission. Uh, I can't quite think of the name of the brilliant engineer who did the development, uh, it will come to me, uh, at uh, Bell Labs. It's not, it has not yet been put into practice, but it will someday. It's the, the interesting thing about it, uh, classical uh, signal theory is uh, entirely linear. And the main point of soliton uh, signal transmission is that the equations are nonlinear. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, one aspect of the practical importance of it. For the importance of its theoretical importance, uh, the KDV equation is completely integrable, and then uh, an astonishing number of other completely integrable systems were discovered. Now, uh, com completely integrable systems can really be solved in the sense that the general population uses the word solve. The word a mathematician uses, and a mathematician says, I've solved the problem, he means he knows the solution exists or is unique, but uh, very often, not much more. Uh, now the question is, um, are completely integrable systems exceptions to uh, the behavior of solutions of non-integrable systems, or is it that other systems have uh, similar behavior, only we are unable to to analyze it. And here our guide might well be the Kolmogorov uh, uh, Arnold Moser theorem, which says near a, a, a com in the neighborhood of a completely integrable system, uh, 
uh, system near a completely integrable system mm. behaves as if it were completely integrable. Now, what near means is one thing when you prove things, other when you do experiments. It's another aspect of, of uh, numerical experimentation revealing things. So I, I do think that by studying completely integrable systems, we give us a clue to the behavior of more general systems as well. I have also a question about your seminal paper, Asymptotic Solutions of Oscillating Initial Value Problems from 1957. And this paper is by many pe uh, people considered to be the genesis of Fourier integral operators. What was the new viewpoint in this paper that proved to be so fruitful? It's, uh, it's a micro-local description of what, uh, what is going on. It, it, uh, it uh, combines uh, looking at the problem in the large and in the small. You, you, it combines both, both aspects and that, that gives it uh, strength. On the, nu the, the numerical implementation of the micro-local point of view uh, is uh, uh, wavelets and uh, similar uh, uh, similar approaches, mm -hmm. which are very powerful numerically. Uh, I would like to, to also uh, touch on your collaboration with Ralph Phillips yes. on and off for a span of more than 30 years on scattering theory yes. and applied to a num in a number of settings. Could you comment on this collaboration and what do you consider to be the most important results you obtained? Uh, oh, that was one of the great pleasures of my life. Uh, Ralph Phillips is uh, one of the great uh, analysts of our time, and we formed a very close friendship as well. Uh, we had a new way of view, view, viewing the scattering process with incoming and outgoing subspaces. And we were, we conceived of the of uh, carving a semi-group out of the unitary group uh, whose infinitesimal generator contained a lot, maybe of almost all the information about the scattering process. Then, uh, so we apply that to, to classical scattering of uh, sound waves and electromagnetic waves by potentials and obstacles. But we, following uh, a very interesting discovery of Fadeev and Pavlov, we followed up to study uh, uh, the spectral theory of automorphic functions. And this turned out to be, as, as already Fadeev and Pavlov observed, uh, the ideal tool for it. And we further elaborated it. And we had a, a brand new approach to Eisenstein series, for instance. It's uh, uh, looking at getting at spectral representation via uh, translation representation. And we even uh, were able to contemplate, again, for the following Fadeev and Pav Pavlov, uh, uh, the Riemann hypothesis uh, peeking around the corner. That must have been exciting. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, whether this approach will lead to a proof of the Riemann hypothesis can be stated in 
purely in terms of decaying signals. But uh, you have to cut out all the standing waves, and so uh, it's unlikely. It's a Niemann hypothesis is a very elusive thing. And uh, you may remember in Per Gint, there is a, a mystical character, the bog, which bars uh, Per Gint's way uh, wherever. Uh, he goes, the amount of hypothesis is a little bit like the bog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, now I want to raise a rather contentious issue with you, and pure mathematics versus applied mathematics. Occasionally one can hear within the mathematical community statements that the theory of nonlinear partial differential equations, though profound and often very important for applications, is fraught with ugly theorems and awkward arguments. In pure mathematics, on the other hand, beauty and aesthetics rule. The English mathematician G. H. Hardy is an extreme example of such an attitude, but it can be encountered also today. How do you respond to this? Does it make you angry? <laughs> uh... I don't get angry very easily. Uh, I, I got angry once at a dean we had, terrible son of a witch, liar, destructive. <laughs> and I got very angry at some uh, a mob of, uh, that occupied the Courant Institute and tried to burn down our computer. Uh, scientific disagreements are, don't arouse my my anger, uh, but uh, it's the, uh, I think this opinion is uh, definitely wrong. I think Paul Halmos once claimed that applied mathematics was, if not ba bad mathematics, at least ugly mathematics. But uh, I think I can point out to a citation in the Abel commission of the elegance of my works. So, uh, now about about Hardy. Uh, when, Har uh, when Hardy wrote uh, Apology of a Mathematician, he was uh, near the end of his life. He was old. I think he had suffered debilitating heart attack. He was very depressed. So that uh, should be taken into account. Uh, the book itself, there was a very harsh criticism by the chemist uh, Frederick Soddy, who was uh, one of the co-discoverers of isotopes. He was uh, shared a Nobel Prize with Rutherford. Uh, he uh, looked at the uh, pride that Hardy takes in the uselessness of mathematics and said, wrote, uh, from such cloistral clowning the world sickens. <laughs> well, I would like to perhaps add something about applied mathematics. My uh, friend and Joe Keller, a most distinguished applied mathematician, was once asked to define applied mathematics. And he came up with this. He said, uh, pure mathematics is a branch of applied mathematics, which is uh, true if you think a little bit. It, mathematics originally, say after Newton, was designed to solve very concrete problems that arose in physics. Later on, these subjects developed on their own and became branches of pure mathematics, but they all came from applied. And as von Neumann pointed out, after a while, these pure branches that develop uh, on their own uh, need invigoration by new empirical material like uh, some scientific questions, experimental facts, and in particular, some numerical evidence. 
Yeah, I, I want to, to raise, as I said, uh, a longer question because I want to make a, a reference to Abel. Yeah. So, so in the history of mathematics, Abel and Galois may have been the first great mathematicians. That one may be described, described as pure mathematicians in quotation marks, not being interested in any applied mathematics. However, Abel did formulate and solve a mechanical problem which was a vast generalization of the totochron problem that Huygens had solved in around 1660. The problem gives rise to an integral equation, the so-called uh, Abel integral equation, and Abel gave an explicit solution, which incidentally may have been the first time in the history of mathematics that uh, such an integral equation had been formulated and, and solved. But interesting enough, by a simple reformulation, one can show that the Abel integral equation and its solution are equivalent to the Radon transform the mathematical foundation on which modern medical topo tomography is based, and for which Hounsfield and McCormack were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1979. Examples of such totally unexpected practical applications of pure mathematical results and theorems abound in the history of mathematics. The group theory that evolved from Galois' work is another striking example. What are your thoughts on this phenomenon? Is it so that deep and in important theorems in mathemat mathematics will eventually find practical applications, for example, in the physical sciences? Uh, well, as you said, pointed out, it has very often happened. Uh, uh, you meant, for instance, Eugene Wigner's use of group theory in, in quantum mechanics. Uh, and this ha has happened. Uh, too often to be just a coincidence, although one might, uh, one perhaps might say that other theories which did not find applications were forgotten, perhaps. As a historian, you might uh, look into that phenomenon. But uh, I do believe that uh, Mathematics has a mysterious unity which uh, connects seemingly distant parts, uh, which is one of the uh, glories of mathematics. Uh, you have said that Los Alamos was the birthplace of computational dynamics. And I guess it is safe to say that the U.S. war effort in the 1940s advanced and accelerated this development. In what way has the emergence of the high-speed computer altered the way mathematics is done within some mathematical fields? And could the tremendous progress that has been achieved within these fields been obtained without the existence of the uh, computer? And in general, which role do you think the high-speed computer will play within mathematics in the future? Oh, it has played uh, several roles. One is, as we saw with uh, Kraskov and Zabaski's discovery of, of solitons, that was, uh, could not, would not have been discovered without computational evidence, the Fermi and Pasta phenomenon of recurrence <coughs> that. Uh, was a very striking thing, maybe. Uh, maybe would have been discovered. So, so that is one thing. But uh, another is this. Uh, in the old days, uh, to get numerical results, you had to make enormously drastic simplifications. If your computations were done by hand or by by computing machines. And uh, the talent of what a drastic or simplification to make was a special talent that did not appeal to most mathematicians. Uh, today, you are in an entirely different situation. You don't have to. Uh, uh, put the problem on a Procrustean bed and mutilate it before you can attack it numerically. And I think that has attracted a much larger group of people to numerical problems of uh, applications. You could really uh, use the full theory. 
it uh, invigorated uh, the subject of linear al algebra, which as a research subject died, I don't know, uh, 1920s, suddenly became a, the, the actual algorithms for carrying out these operations. It was full of surprises, like the fast Strassen algorithm. And uh, uh, in the new edition of my linear algebra, I intend to add a chapter on the numerical calculation of eigenvalues of symmetric matrices. You know, in, it's a truism that due to increased speeds, speed of computers, uh, uh, a problem that took a month uh, uh, 40 years ago can be done in minutes, if not seconds. Uh, most of the speed up is attributed, at least by the general public, to increase speed of computers. But if you uh, look at it, actually only half of the speed up is due to the increased speed. The other half is due to increasingly clever algorithms. And uh, it takes mathematicians to invent clever algorithms, I think. Uh, by and large, physicists, chemists would go at a direct approach. So it's very important to get mathematicians involved, and they are uh, involved now. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question to you is the following. Could you give us personal examples of how questions and methods from applied points of view have triggered pure, again in quotation mark, mathematical research and results? And conversely, are there examples where your theory of nonlinear partial differential equations, especially in explanation of how discontinuities propagate, have had commercial interest? I'm thinking about oil exploration in particular, so important for this country. Yes, uh, the oil exploration uh, uses uh, signals uh, generated by detonations that are propagated through the earth and through the old reservoir and are recorded at uh, distant uh, stations. It's a so-called inverse problem. If you know the distribution of the densities of materials and the associated uh, wave speeds, then you can propagate, you can calculate how signals propagate. The inverse problem is if you know how signals propagate to deduce from it the distribution of material. It's, uh, since these signals are discontinuities, you need the theory of propagation of discontinuities. Otherwise, it's somewhat similar to, to the medical imaging problem, also inverse problems. The, signals go not through the earth, but through the human body. But uh, there is a similarity in the problems. But there is no doubt that you have to understand the direct problem very well before you can tackle the inverse problem. OK, I think I'll take over now. And I would like to start with uh, some questions related to your personal history. And the first one is about your interest in and your great aptitude also for solving problems of a type that you called mathematics light yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to mention just a few, already as a 17-year-old 17 17 boy, you uh, gave an elegant solution to a problem that was posed by Erdős and is related to a certain inequality for polynomials, uh, which was earlier proved by Bernstein. And the second uh, problem much later in your career that was concerned with the so-called polya functions, functions that map the unit interval continuously onto a right angle triangle. And you investigated its amazing differentiability properties. So my question about that is about uh, the mathematical education you were exposed to in your native Hungary. Uh, was problem solving somehow encouraged in a very specific way back in Hungary, and how did, what effects did that have for your mathematical career later on? 
um, problem solving was regarded as the royal road to stimulate mm -hmm. talented youngsters. And uh, I was very pleased to learn that here in Norway, they have successful high school contests. The winners were honored this morning. Uh, but uh, after a while, one shouldn't stick to pro problem solving. One should broaden out. Uh, I returned every once in a while. The, the differentiability of Polya's function, mm -hmm. I knew Polya quite well. I had taken a um, summer course with him in 46. And that came this way. I was teaching a course on real variables, and I presented Polya's example of a, uh, area filling curve and I gave as homework to the students to prove that it's no very differentiable. Uh, nobody did the homework so then I sat down and I found out the situation more complicated mm -hmm. like that. So uh, there was a tradition in Hungary to give uh, to look for the simplest proof. You may be familiar with Erdős's concept of the book. Yeah. That's a book kept by the Lord uh, of all theorems and the best proofs. And if uh, the highest praise that Erdős had for a proof is that it's out of the book. <laughs> and so uh, uh, one can overdo that, but uh, I had g given, you, you may have seen very early, uh, shortly after I got my PhD, I learned about the Hahn Banach theorem, and I thought that it could be used to prove the existence of Green's function. And it's a very simple argument. I, I believe it's a simple, it's, a, it's out of the book for the existence of Green's function. And uh, I have a, I think the a proof of the Brouwer fixed point theorem using calculus, just change of variables, that is probably the simplest proof. Uh, it's, uh, I think that is part of the Hungarian tradition. Only one must not overdo it. Mm -hmm. Well, a bit in the same direction. There is an impressive list of great Hungarian physicists and mathematicians of, in particular, a Jewish background that had to flee to the United States. Yeah. Uh, I mean, after the rise of fascism, nazism, and anti-Semitism in mm -hmm. Europe. How do you explain this extraordinary culture of excellence in Hungary and in Central Europe that produced people like De Hevesi, Szilard, Wigner, Teller, von Neumann, von Kármán, Erdő, Sőja, Szégül, Pörja, and yourself, yeah. just yeah, to mention probably. a few. <laughs> there is a very interesting book written by John Lukács. Uh, its title is Budapest 1900, and it chronicles the rise of a middle class, rise of commerce, rise of industry, rise of science, rise of literature, and it was fueled by many things, a long period of peace. The influx of uh, uh, mostly Jewish population from the East uh, eager to rise. Uh, an intellectual tradition you know, in mathematics, uh, Boyoy was a culture hero to Hungarians, and that's why mathematics was particularly uh, looked upon as a glorious profession. But who nurtured is fantastic. I mean, this is uh, so remarkable. Perhaps much credit should be given to Julius Koenig, probably his name is not even known to you. He was a student of uh, 
Kronecker, I believe, but he also learned uh, Cantor set theory and made some basic contributions to it. I think he was uh, influential in uh, nurturing mathematics. His, his son was a very distinguished mathematician, Danash Koenig, uh, really the fa father of modern graph theory. And then th there arose uh, extraordinary people. Fayer had an enormous influence. There were uh, too many to fill uh, positions uh, in a small country like Hungary, so that's why they had to go abroad. Uh, a big part of it was anti-Semitism. There is a, a charming st story I, about the appointment of Fayer as uh, professor at, the, at Budapest, um, there was opposition to it. At that time, uh, there was a very distinguished theologian, uh, Ignatius Fayer, in the Faculty of Theology. Uh, well, Fayer's original name was Weiss. Uh, and so one of the opponents said pointedly, this uh, Professor Leopold Fayer that you are proposing, is he related to our distinguished colleague, uh, uh, Father Ignatius Fayer? And Utwish, the great physicist who was pushing the appointment, uh, replied without batting an eyelash, illegitimate son. <laughs> <laughs> good, and he got the job? He got the job. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the mathematician Stanislav Ulau was involved with the Manhattan Project and yes. is considered to be one of the fathers of the hydrogen bomb. And he wrote in his autobiography, Adventures of the Mathematicians, and now I cite, it is still an unending source of surprise for me to see how a few scribbles on a blackboard or on a sheet of, sheet of paper could change the course of human affairs. Do you share this feeling? And what were and what are your feelings to what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and to the victims of the explosions of the atomic bombs that then brought an end to World War II? Well, let me answer that last one first. Uh, I was in the army, and all of us in the army expected to be sent to the Pacific to participate in the invasion of Japan. Uh, you remember the tremendous slaughter that the invasion of Normandy brought. That would have been nothing compared to invasion of Japanese mainland. You remember the tremendous slaughter on Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Uh, Japanese would have resisted to the last man. Uh, and uh, the atomic bomb put an end to all this, made an invasion unnecessary. So uh, I don't believe uh, the uh, revisionist historians who said, oh, Japan was already beaten, they would have surrendered anyway. I don't see any evidence for that. Uh, there's another point. Uh, which I raised once with someone who had been involved in the atomic bomb project. Would the world have that horror of nuclear war if you had not seen what it could, what one bomb could do? So it, the, the world was inoculated against using nuclear weapons by, the, by its use. I'm not saying that alone justifies it, but it was not, that was not the justification for it. But I think that's a historical fact. 
now about a scribble changing history. Uh, sure, theory of uh, special theory of relativity. It would be unimaginable today for quantum mechanics, scribbles, all. Mulan was a very interesting uh, mathematician. He, uh, he was an idea man. Most mathematicians like to push their ideas out. He preferred throwing out ideas. Uh, his good friend Rota even suggested that he did not have the technical ability or patience to work them out. But uh, if so, then it's an instance of uh, Ulan uh, turning a disability to a tremendous advantage. Uh, we were good friends, uh, and I, I learned a lot from him. Your main workplace has been the current Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York, and you served as its director for a long period. Can you describe what made this institute that was created by the German refugee, Richard Kurnd, a very special place in the early days? Were there particular people like, for example, your advisor Friedrichs, a particular spirit, the atmosphere? And the second question, is the current institute today still a special place that differs from others? Uh, to answer your first question, certainly the personality of Courant was decisive. Uh, Courant saw mathematics very broadly. He was suspicious of specialization. Uh, he wanted uh, it drawn as broadly as possible, and that's how it came about that applied topics and pure mathematics uh, were pursued side by side, often by the same people. This made the Courant Institute unique at the time of its founding and in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And since then, there are other centers where applied mathematics is respected and pursued. Uh, I'm happy to say that this original spirit uh, is still present in the Courant Institute. Uh, we still have large areas of applied interest, meteorology and climatology under Andy Maida, uh, solid state uh, material science, Bob Cohn and others fluid dynamics, and also differential geometry, also some pure aspects of, of partial differential equations, even some algebra. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, that the Courant Institute has it's now the third generation that's running it, and the spirit that Courant instilled in it, a kind of a family feeling, still, still prevails. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to note that uh, many uh, Norwegian mathematicians received their training at the Courant Institute and later rose to be leaders in their field. So. We come to another topic. You were already telling us about your collaboration with Ralph Phillips. And more generally speaking, looking through your publication list and through the theorems and methods you have given, given names to, it is apparent that you have had a vast collaboration with a lot of mathematicians. Is this sharing ideas a particularly successful and maybe also joyful way of advancing for you? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, Mathematics is a social phenomenon, after all. It's, uh, and uh, 
Uh, collaboration is a um, psychologically an interesting phenomenon. A friend of mine had uh, Vera Steiner John has written a book book about it. It's uh, two halves of a solution are supplied by two different people and something quite wonderful comes out of it. Talking about work style in more general, many mathematicians have a very particular work style when they work hard on a certain problem or a certain area. How would you characterize your, your own particular way of thinking, working, writing? Is it rather playful, rather industrious, or both? Or? Well, uh, let me tell you how Phillips characterized. He thought I was lazy <laughs> <laughs> because he was very hard working. Um, he was a product of the Depression, which imposed a certain strict discipline on people. He thought I did, wasn't, didn't work hard enough. I worked hard enough. <laughs> Sometimes mathematical insights seem to rely on a sudden, unexpected inspiration. Do you have examples of this sort from your own career? And what is the background for such sudden inspiration, in your opinion? Well, <laughs> the question reminds me it's a sto story, presumably a stu true story about uh, uh, the German mathematician, oh, Schottky. When he reached, uh, I don't know, 70 or 80, there was a, a celebration of it and an interview like this in which he was asked, to what do you attribute your... Uh, uh, creativity, productivity. Uh, the questions threw him into a great confusion. Finally, he said, uh, but gentlemen, if one thinks about mathematics for 50 years, one must think of something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it was different with uh, Hilbert. Uh, this is a story I heard from Courant on the same o similar occasion, 70th birthday, he was asked, to, to what do you attribute <laughs> your great creativity and originality? Uh, he had the answer immediately. He said, I attribute it to my very bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he really had to reconstruct everything, and then it was became something else, something better. So maybe I w that's all I should say about <laughs> between these two extremes. Mm -hmm. I have very good memory, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, question in a different direction. You were several times the head of large organizations, just to mention director of the current institute from 72 to 1980, I noted, president of the American Mathematical Society from 1977 to 1980, leader of the, what was called the LAX panel on the National Science Board from 1980 to 1986. Can you tell us about some of the most important decisions that had to be taken in this period? Um, well, uh, yes. Uh, the president of the Math Society is uh, more of a figurehead. His influence lies in appointing members of committees. Uh, being director of the uh, Courant Institute, I, let's see, what, uh, it, I started my directorship at the worst possible time for New York University. They have just closed down their School of Engineering. And that meant that a bunch of mathematicians from the engineering school were transferred to the Courant Institute. But also there were, were there was a group of engineers uh, who wanted to start, uh, this was at the time that our compute, that the computer science department was founded by Jack Schwartz. The engineer, uh, uh, 
group of engineers wanted to s start activity in informatics, which is the engineer's word for the same thing. And as director, I fought very hard to stop that. I think it would have been very bad for for the university to have two competing departments would have been certainly bad for our computer science department. Uh, other, uh, I was instrumental in hiring Charlie Peskin uh, uh, at the recommendation of Alexander Chorin. I'm very pleased with that. And uh, in hiring Sylvan Capel at the recommendation of Joe Cohn. Both were enormous successes. Uh, what were my failures? Well, maybe when the computer science department was founded, I should have insisted on having a very high standard of hiring rather than just uh, we needed people to teach courses, to do the research projects, and uh, I, I think we should have exercised in the early days. We could have become the number one computer science department. Uh, right now, we are. Uh, the quality has improved very much. We have a wonderful chairman, Margaret Wright, but it it took a long time. Uh, on the Sci National Science Board, that was my uh, most pleasant exp administrative experience. It's a policy-making body for the National Science Foundation. So I found out what making policy means. It's just a phrase. Most of the time, uh, it just means nodding yes, uh, a few times saying no. Uh, and then there are sometimes uh, windows of opportunity. And the lax panel was response to such a thing, because I noticed through my own experience and those of my friends who were interested in large-scale computing, in particular Paul Garabedian, he, he was complaining bitterly that uh, university computational scientists had no access to the uh, supercomputers. Uh, uh, at a certain point, the government, which alone had enough money to purchase these supercomputers, stopped placing them at universities. They went to national labs, industrial labs. And unless you happen to have a friend there with whom you collaborated, you had no access. And that uh, was uh, very bad for, well, from the point of view of the advance of computational science, because the most talented people were at the universities. At that time, uh, computing at a remote, accessing and computing at a remote site became possible thanks to ARPANET, which then became a model for the internet. And so uh, the panel that I uh, established uh, made strong recommendation that the NSF establish uh, computing centers. And that was followed. And each year, uh, tens of thousands of reports recommend things, and it's rather rare that it's followed up. So I feel, um, well, my, my quote on this achievement was a paraphrase of Emerson. Uh, uh, Nothing can resist the force of an idea that is 10 years overdue. <laughs> I think Emerson said, whose time has come. But. Yeah. <laughs>
You've been particularly engaged in the teaching of calculus. For instance, you've written a te calculus textbook together with your wife, Anli, as one of the co-authors. In this connection, you have expressed th strong opinions about how calculus should be exposed to beginning students. Could you elaborate a bit on this? Uh, yes. Uh, um, the, uh, our calculus book was uh, enormously unsuccessful. Uh, it, uh, in spite of containing many excellent ideas, uh, part of it was uh, uh, it was not uh, prese quite presented in a fashion that students could absorb it. A calculus book has to be fine-tuned and uh, I didn't have the patience for it. Uh, uh, Annalie would have, but I bullied her too much, I'm afraid. So sometimes I, I dream of redoing it uh, because the, the ideas that were in there and that I had since, I think, are still valid. I'm not, uh, of course, there is, has been a calculus reform movement and some some good books have come out of it, but I don't think they are the answer. Uh, first of all, the books are too thick, thousand, over 1,000, 1,200 pages. Uh, it's unfair to give such a book into the hands of an unsuspecting student. He can barely carry it, and the reaction to it would be, my God, I have to learn all that's in it. Well, all that is not in it. Uh, so, uh, secondly, if you compare it to the old standards, uh, Thomas say, it's not all that different. The order of the topics, the concepts. Uh, in my calculus book, for instance, I, instead of uh, continuity at a point, I advocate the uniform continuity that you can explain much easier than continuity at a point when then saying a function is continuous, it's continuous every point. You lose the students. There are too many quantifiers in that. Uh, but uh, the mathematical community is enormously conservative. Continuity has been defined pointwise, and so it should be. Uh, other things. Uh, to be sure, there are applications in these new books, but the applications don't stand out. They are subsidiary, uh, and in my book, there were uh, chapters devoted to the application. That's how it should be done. They should be featured as very... Uh, I've had many other ideas since I still dream of <laughs> perhaps if age permits and I'm looking for a good collaborator. I've recently met someone who expressed admiration for the original book. Maybe I could do that uh, if I have the energy. I have other things to do like a second edition of linear algebra and uh, uh, some uh, revising some old lecture notes on hyperbolic equations, which is almost ready. But, uh, and, and uh, even if uh, the, I could do with a collaborator uh, a calculus, would it be accepted? Not, not clear. Uh, I thought of the phrase, uh, you know, re defining real numbers, that's how you have to start. Uh, I thought of the phrase uh, in 1873, uh, Dedekind posed the important question, what are and what should be the real numbers? Unfortunately, he gave the wrong answer as far as calculus students are concerned. The right answer is infinite decimals.
I don't know if such jokes will go down. <laughs> <laughs> to come to an end, I would like to ask you about uh, some of your private interests and hobbies that are not directly related to mathematics. Oh, uh, I love poetry. Uh, Hungarian poetry is particularly beautiful, but uh, English poetry is perhaps even more beautiful. I, uh, I love to play tennis. Now my knees are a little wobbly and I can't run anymore, but perhaps I'll, these can be replaced. I'm not there yet, but uh, my three, my son and three grandsons are tennis enthusiasts, so I, I can play doubles with them. I like to read. I have a knack for writing. Alas, these days uh, I write obituaries. Well, it's better to write them than being written about. <laughs> you write even haikus, I saw. And I, I wrote yeah. a ha that's right, you saw. Uh, I got that idea from, you know, nice, uh, you know, article, uh, Marshall Stone. I forget exactly where it was, had written that uh, the mathematical language is enormously concentrated. Uh, uh, they are like haikus. And I thought I would take it one step further <laughs> and actually write a haiku. Uh, well, Professor Lax, I would like to thank you very much for this interview on behalf of the Norwegian, the Danish, and the European Mathematical Society. Thanks a lot. Thank you.